Well, hello everyone. One thing that academics like to do on a weekly basis is to read each other their papers. I want to read you my paper. We'll do some picture overlays. It's going to be absolutely brilliant on some Giza um, archaeological discoveries uh, that we've made. And these are brand new, brand new information. You're going to see exactly um, so some some really interesting information as well on why. The Sphinx could well be a dog. We've found some dog alignments pointing to the Sphinx. Very interesting stuff. This makes, uh, this blows the Orion mystery out of the water. So, you know, I should have millions of views on this. So share it around. Anyway, in 2020, using a software overlay, I suggested and confirmed that the pyramid causeways actually point to sunrises of certain prehistoric holy days. The implication is that priests living at the pyramids used the causeways for sunrise worship. There would thus be a dramatic effect created as priests advanced along the causeway away from or towards the setting sun. I propose a full circuit for maximum effect. To my knowledge, archaeologists never discussed this despite the obvious similarity of the Egyptian causeway with the Stonehenge Solar Avenue. Even Norman Lockyer, the founder of archaeoastronomy in England, uh, in Egypt, did not realise that uh, this seeking stellar risings to precede sunrises, in his language, helical risings, instead of possibly more appropriate sunrises themselves. This is despite calling his seminal book that launched the discipline of archaeoastronomy, the dawn of astronomy. This discovery was confirmed when I noticed that adjacent pyramids or even causeway complexes, sometimes many kilometres apart, have causeways pointing to very different holy days than their neighbours, to probably avoid any nasty priestly competition. The holy festival dates with us rationed around, not all seen at any one complex, so that people could travel between pyramid complexes to celebrate them. The discoveries which follow indicate Giza, as being an Egyptian centre of underworld worship. I applied Coptic holy days where possible to the finds to try to interpret them and found some matches. We also found matches with pagan holidays such as Halloween. Obviously the Coptic holidays are an overlay over, Christian, uh, over Egyptian prehistoric holy days. It needs to be said that the Egyptian festival information alone seems to offer an incomplete and unsatisfying understanding of Giza. This indicates that Giza cannot be understood according to surviving pyramid texts or later New Kingdom stories and rituals. So now we go to today's discoveries in 2021. So the background is that last year, when we made our alignment discoveries, we also noted that the, the stunning array of English and Proto-English, Frisian, Danish words in prehistoric Egyptian religious usage, which was another first. Uh, for example, Thoth, God of the Dead, and the God of Knowledge. And in German we have Tot, in English we have Thought, and that covers both of them. And, and there, there are more similarities. And this describes the God better than an Egyptian or Hamito-Semitic etymology of the same word. It is just not a simil it is just not, not just a similarity, it is the same word. We thus made a suggestion of a Germanic migration to Egypt following the uh, sinking of Doggerland in the 5000s BC. Another explanation for the Germanic words in um, ancient prehistoric Egypt, failing all that, may be the presence of Gutians, which may be the Goths, in nearby prehistoric Sumer. So I thought the other day. Why not ignore the Coptic holy days and now apply the Germanic European holy days to Giza and see what happens? The results of this investigation are shocking and striking. The Romans had a strong Germanic element, evident in descriptions of their early emperors. We know a great deal about their holy days and rituals, but little about non-Roman holy days in prehistoric times. Hence, we could rely on Roman information for specifics about European prehistoric festivals, and that is what we will now do. So here are the new discoveries. On applying Roman and Germanic holidays to Giza, I discovered that the Romans and Giza builders appear to stem from a similar religious cult. In fact, the Romans are even closer to the Giza builders than are the Germanics, as, as you will see. 
but Germanic festival information is incomplete. So why are the Romans related to the Giza builders? What, what are some reasons for this? So Italy itself is crawling with megalithic pre-Roman ruins, many uncovered by Piranesi centuries ago. The pre-Roman Etruscans or earlier people actually built pyramids on an epic scale in Italy. And not only that, they embodied a scale model of the sphere of the earth, demolished by later Romans out of spite. And we know that, uh, just, just adding to that, we know that the Great Pyramid is, is probably a, a, a planar uh, ge geometric representation of the Earth. The surviving Roman Pyramid of Cestius, the uh, Cestius I have noticed, is possibly eight-sided and contains air or star shafts as at Giza. No Giza investigator ever looks at this humble pyramid. They should. It is certainly earlier than it appears. And that, that is according to medieval legend. I've suggested the Santa Cristina well, Sardinia, was constructed by Giza builders. Look at the quality of construction. In fact, one can see it's a 2D pyramid with solar capstone, i.e. a ray of light would shine into it, illuminating and blessing the waters within. This implies it is part of the pyramid cult, which at least in Egypt is pre-2000 BC. 2. I found confirmation for Robert Temple's Sphinx Dog Theory. This was a theory also suggested by earlier Egyptologists. Namely, the Carfrey Causeway points to two dawn alignments. Uh, with the sun, that is. One, Halloween. The gates of the underworld open the realm of Anubis, which is the dog. Two, the second alignment, the 15th Feb, is St. Valentine's Day. But looking earlier, it is actually the Roman Lupercal in February, a time of fevers or love. Hence, fe fevers, February. Romans saw romantic love as a fever, an illness. Lupus means dog. I think Duran Duran's phrase, hungry like the wolf, as a possible crossover explanation linking Lupercal with later Valentine's Day, is a good way of making us understand what they were trying to do. Roman men, uh, dressed with dog masks, uh, possibly hunting women. It was a fertility festival. And of course, that reminds us of something in Egypt, doesn't it? So, summary, applying Roman and Germanic festival dates to Giza, suddenly sense is made of the Sphinx as a dog, underworld creature, and symbol of fertility. And uh, why should this be? The causeway from the Carfrey Pyramid to the Sphinx points to, as we said, two wolf festivals, Lupercal, Valentine's Day, and Halloween Harvest Fest, opening the underworld, so you see Anubis, QED, the Sphinx is solved as a dog. Now, there's additional evidence. St. Valentine was a martyred Christian overlaying a much older fertility tradition. The Sphinx is on the Valentine's Day causeway alignment, meaning it would be a fertility god. It is known that when the New Kingdom Sphinx Stela was uncovered, this is in the 19th century, local villagers began to chip away pieces of it as totems beneficial to fertility, and no one knew why they were doing this. It seemed to be a fertility place. And incidentally, Cupid, if you want to know who Cupid is, was probably some underworld leprechaun. A, a, a 2018 study suggests leprechaun and lupercal have the same word origin. So if you look up lupercal on Wikipedia, you'll, you'll see the reference for that. Three, all the festivals seen using the Giza Causeway alignments at Giza are, are basically Bacchanalia Halloween type affairs. They would all have involved wearing masks while making festival, because this is what happened in Europe until modern times on those dates. For example, Halloween is the time when the English mummers, or mimers I suppose, wore masks, knocking on doors to collect money and presents. Thus, we explain the Egyptian fascination with their earlier gods, presumably prior to some cataclysm in 3150 BC, being men that wore animal masks. The later Egyptians, possibly lacking these masquerade festivities, may have assumed that this is what their gods uh, actually once looked like. QED, and that's just a, a clever word that means it's been solved. I hope. The people who built Giza were a bridge between these earlier peoples, and later Egyptians, who perhaps didn't understand the earlier rituals. Four, the Khufu, Khufu Khafre causeways are what I call a swing dial between what I also call Little Halloween, with Khufu, and Great Halloween. This implies the Giza and Sphinx and causeway builders were obsessed with the spirit world opening up. Now let me explain this. 
The Khufu Pyramid Causeway points to two dates, the Roman Vinalia Rustica on August 19th, which Coptics overlaid with the Transfiguration date, a kind of ripening of Jesus as he climbs a mountain, changes colours, shines, and amazes his disciples. But the early festival would have been ripening of wine. And, and fertility. Vinalia Rustica, which in Latin means country wine festival, is basically a very ancient fertility rite, but we don't know much about it. The other date is the 22nd April, which I note is the beginning of the week leading up to the 30th of April, which Germans recognize as Walpurgisnacht. Walpurgis, like Lupercal in February, the time of fevers, is actually quite similar to Halloween, except it occurs earlier in the year, with masks being put on, foods being left for spirits to collect, etc., in prehistoric European tradition. There was also a carnival-like festivity, which implies to me the pyramids were literally harvest hills, as harvest hills uh, incidentally operated in Europe, with festivals taking place nearby. Now, I'll just interrupt that to say that what happened in centuries past is that at, at, at Great Hills or even artificial mounds, uh, farmers would actually uh, meet up and, and have a festival once or twice a year, and, and people would drive their cattle across long distances um, to sell that cattle at the mound, uh, possibly following lee lines. And this goes from the Stone Age until literally the 19th, early 20th century. They don't really do that anymore. So we continue. The underworld is open on these dates, hence the link to the great god of the underworld. The Germanic son of Loki, the fabled fallen god from heaven, now imprisoned underground, seen as a corrupting influence on humanity. His son Fenrir is possibly what we call the Sphinx, and that is a wolf. Someone decided to change it to a human face, altering its proportion. And that is what Robert Temple points out. Now we move down to the tiny Menkore pyramid. Its causeway and location really should be placed between the two large pyramids. And it is a puzzle why it isn't so, being an, a, a solar intermediary, a sunrise intermediary between them. So whoever cracks that puzzle will know a lot more about Giza. Now, Menkore's straight causeway points to the two equinoxes. These are the spring equinox, Isra. Easter, that is east, which is what it faces. Forget Ishtar. That is putting the cart before the horse. Now, uh, I'll just say that they always say Easter comes from Ishtar and... Uh, that isn't really the way it works. If that was if that was the case, uh, people living in Germany and Europe would look like Phoenicians, but that is not the case. In fact, the word clearly comes from East or Ost in German. Ishtar in the Near East must then stem from the Germanic goddess Istra, indicating a migration at one time, possibly through which they reached Egypt. It also points to the autumnal equinox or September 23rd. The Giza people actually would meet up in the week, uh, or all, all the people would meet up at Giza as Harvest Hills in the week prior to, uh, just in the week prior to Walpurgisnacht, or just prior to Halloween. And then they would have a festival for about a week, and then who knows what would happen. Uh, at the festival, and, and why would they turn up at, 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 in the desert at the pyramids? Well, they weren't a desert at the time. They were actually a, a savanna. They were not too bad. They were they were nice uh, nice places to have a festival. There we go. So let us summarize and elaborate a little. So starting with the Khufu alignment on top, we see basically a ripening and approach of summer in the Valpurgis and the wine festival alignment. Hence the womb inside the pyramid for new life. This explains the presence of the king's chamber, etc., as a kind of womb. Now we go south to the Khafre pyramid. We see the approach of death, the end of the cycle, because we see Halloween, which in Germanic is called Harvest Fest or Winternachten, Winter Nights. This is a time when people would go inside to work on indoor crafts. And one can hardly see this as suitable for temperate Egypt. So, so why celebrate it in Egypt? 
Since there is no more life to be had, Khufu Khafre's pyramid has no womb, no internal chambers. Going further south to the Menkore pyramid, we encounter the node of instantaneous change. For while Khafre and Khufu causeway lines signal an impending approach of change, Menkore's equinoctial alignments lie at the times intermediate to the solstices on the very nodes of change. So in summary, I do not know if the 4th dynasty were Germanic peoples or not. It is known that Khufu's daughter, Meren Sank III, was blonde, so we uh, can say they may have been mixed with the Egyptians or others. I have pointed out that Khufu is a Chinese name as well as a German name, the name being something like Gotho and the female version Gita. Or Gita. Got also means God. And we know that Khufu was something of a megalomaniac, so that fits. Did he call himself God in Proto-German? Did he call himself after the Goths or the Gutians in Sumer? If so, was there a dynastic a royal language of the conquerors separate from regular Egyptian, yet unwritten or not surviving? Or did the conquerors, if that is what they were, simply forget this language over time? To complete the picture, I think Kafre was uh, Geoffrey or Godfrey and Menkore was Mikarinus, as Herodotus called him, uh, and that would uh, imply Mega Rain, uh, or Great King, but that is speculation. The dates we uncovered for the sunrise alignments by comparison are a solid archaeological discovery. For too long, archaeologists have assumed that it takes an aircraft or a cruise liner to travel. It is time for a reassessment of any artificial divisions of the human family in prehistory. Thank you. Okay, people, now keep watching for a summary of all this because very, very important, showing which will show the pyramid of growth, the pyramid of death, and also the pyramid of regulation, probably Menkore. But to add to the Valentine's Day of February the 15th, this overlapped with another old festival called Fornicalia. And you think Fornicalia, it sounds like fornication, doesn't it? Well, that's the English version of that, which probably comes from the fact it was held about the time of Valentine's Day. But in fact, it does not mean this. In Latin, it simply means, relates to fornax, an oven that the Romans worshipped as a goddess. And this was a baking festival, which lasted for nine days in February, and it shifted around February, eventually starting at around mid-February, the 17th of February, a couple days after Valentine's Day. And this fornicalia was a baking festival. So one can imagine and one can start to realize why, if this uh, such a festival may have occurred at the Khufu pyramid, why these pyramids were in medieval times seen as granaries. Well, it probably relates to their harvest hill usage. The harvest was brought there, baking was done there. Remember I made a video about the so-called Khafre pyramid battery could the, these are so-called workers' barracks, but why weren't they demolished afterwards? Well, I reckon the baking might have been done there. A battery of bakeries, quite possibly. Hey, peeps. So to say it all again, because this is just the best discovery ever, the best maybe of the 21st century so far, because this is like finding a new part of Giza. This is like finding Davidson's chamber, because this is real. This is not speculation. I do a lot of speculation. This is discovery. So the Khufu pyramid, in the Khufu pyramid, we see a spring and summer pyramid. It's a growing pyramid. In Khafre, we see an autumn and winter pyramid. It's a shrinking pyramid. It's a, it's a pyramid going into winter, into the underworld. Uh, and points it's towards the Sphinx. What is the Sphinx? We'll see in a second. And the Menkore Pyramid, it's, a, it's another two festivals. Of course, one of the equinoxes, which happens to be Easter, and uh, which is an incredibly ancient festival. We know it's ancient because it's determined by the moon. It's pre-solar calendar. And of course, the, uh, the autumnal one, 22 September. But let's get into it. So with the Khufu Festival, it's the festivals that happen at Khufu. And by the way, what would have happened is these were we, these were festi festivities for thousands and thousands of people to gather at the pyramids in the same way that people would gather at the harvest mounds in England, at the harvest mounds in Ireland. 
And across Europe, people would gather at these mounds at certain times of year. They'd, they'd rustle up all their cattle along ancient prehistoric trackways, take their cattle there, they'd don masks, they would have festivities, they would meet other people, they would buy weapons, buy axes from axe smiths, farming equipment, they would do all this thing in deeply prehistoric times. They would have done the same thing here. This was a meeting place. That's why it's in the middle of Egypt. Well, one reason why it's in the middle of Egypt. So with Khufu, clearly the alignment celebrates two dates. The first one is the 22nd of April. So at the 22nd of April, we're mo- we're, we've hit spring, but it's not quite warm yet. It's not M- M- May yet. So it's the beginning of the week of Valpurgisnacht, and I call this Little Halloween because it's the same as Halloween, except it's not as well known as Halloween, is it? Halloween's going into winter. This one's going into summer. And then at the end of summer, 19th of August, we have which is what the, the causeway points to, the sunrise of 19th of August, we have the vanilla, what the Romans called the Vanilla Rustica, or it's basically a, the, 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 the country wine harvest. It's basically a ripening of the grapes. And Coptic Christians um, place the 19th of August at, at the Christ's transfiguration. So in a way, that is a ripening of Jesus, because if you know what the transfiguration is... It's basically in the the New Testament, Jesus goes up onto a hill with his disciples. And when he's on this holy hill, holy hills, he basically starts changing colors, energizing. He's like a superhero in a Japanese comic. And um, so that's Khufu. And that, what the looking at the horizon, the sunrise, it's called the horizon of Khufu. Now we know why it's called the horizon of Khufu. It's relating to the sunrises. Uh, uh, that are happening here. So Carfrey, what does Carfrey point to? Well, now we have an autumn winter pyramid. So it's pointing to, uh, so firstly, moving moving into winter, October 30th, you know, October 30th in Europe, boom, it's starting to really get chilly. So uh, it's getting, it's getting, you know, the sun's hardly in the sky during the daytime. It sets so quickly. And it's Halloween harvest fest, winter nights, and you have masquerades and things at Halloween in prehistoric times. And of course, at Halloween, it's the opening of the underworld. And of course, who is the deity of the underworld? It is, of course, well, it is, of course, Anubis. So is Anubis the Sphinx? I ask that question. And at February the 15th, which it also points to, we have the Anubis festival in ancient Rome. Because this was called the Lupercal, which means the, sort of the, the, the wolf's the wolf's time, and men would dress as a wolf, possibly for chasing women. So, and this this preceded Valentine's Day, which was the name of it later on, named after Saint Valentinian, who sounds almost like a Roman emperor, doesn't he? So we have to ask: Was the Sphinx a dog? Um, because he he's guarding the underworld at this particular time of Halloween. And now, of course, we have the Menkore pyramid. So, in the we call it the I call it the in between pyramid because it points to the equinoxes. And literally, we have the definition of Easter right here, pointing east. So, twenty fifth of March is the first equinox. Now, we don't date equ- uh, Easter by the equi- by the solar calendar as we should. We date it by a lunar calendar. The reason we date it by a lunar calendar is we're following an ancient prehistoric tradition when the solar calendar probably didn't exist. So, it's ancient. It's facing east, celebrating Easter, and the other date is the other equinox, the 22 September. So these are the two dates when the sun rises at this equinox. And uh, this is the fall feast or the Dojinki in uh, Slav countries, or the harvest festival in England. In the Slav countries, the Dojinki is basically what happens is there were people, uh, people would line up in a procession, everyone contributing a little bit of their of their crop. And they would all hand it to a a person who makes basically a reef to crown someone. And then they put that reef on the guest of honor's head. And I'm sort of wondering to myself, okay, this is a very nice festival. um, But but is this also a resurrection festival? Because we know there's a dark side to these pagan traditions. They sometimes executed criminals as well. So is there a bit of Wicker Man going on here? Was there a bit of sacrifice happening as well? So that is what's going on there. 
and um, that is a that is a that is a discovery. I have looked and looked and looked. What archaeologists basically say in their in their uh, papers, I'm, I'm not knocking them or anything, but I, I see they write about causeways. They say, oh, it goes, it goes slightly, it goes to the east, but slightly to the south. They don't even write how many degrees it is, which is not a bad thing. I mean, they're not mathematicians, they're not astronomers, but look, this is what's going on. The, the ancient priests were mathematicians and they were astronomers. They were not just humanities people. They were extremely highly educated people. Um, so we have to look at it from the astronomical perspective as well. Now, I, I, I really wish I could, uh, I really wish I could stop doing this. I want to stop doing this. I want to stop doing this. Um, but I, I want to say thanks to my patrons. Um, see, unfortunately, I, I could be making, you know, a lot of money, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. Oh, well. And I say unfortunately because I, I wish I could be uh, doing something else and getting really rich, being a banker, uh, but I'm, uh, I can't because this is just so damn interesting, isn't it? Anyway, but because of that, we have patrons. So thank you to my patrons. Thank you to you guys. Have made, you guys have actually made this possible, this discovery possible. Thank you to everyone else who watches. You guys are the greatest ever. Have the best day you've ever had, the best evening, the best morning, whatever time of day it is. Oh, yeah.